All right, now we would use these to form the six bonds of the octahedron and put the lone pairs in here, uh, and that's the way, uh, so that's the octahedral model. So I got the metals going there. The metal... Well, remember that the, all of these are orbitals for the metal. These are all of the orbitals uh, for the metal. The metal is going to use these orbitals to bond to the ligands. But they're empty initially because the ligands have electrons, and that's why they got put inside. Anyway. Well, in this model, I suppose we would think of um, both uh, the, uh, so these might have electrons from the metal. The electron, so the metal might be contributing some electrons and the ligands are contributing some electrons. Um, and then all, all the shared electrons will go here. This is a covalent model of uh, bonding. Remember, this is not the crystal field theory again. In the crystal field theory, we model everything as ionic. And in that case, only the ligands. The ligands have all the electrons and the transition metal has none. But in the covalent model, we imagine the transition metal sharing the electrons with the ligands. So um, this will, these will start, I suppose, with some of the electrons that the uh, transition metal started with. Um, and then it'll be filled with other electrons from the ligands and they'll be forming covalent shared models. Oh, all right, Bob, I didn't see that. I should stick with what he's saying. Okay, well, let, let's stick with the way he put it. So he said, he said he would put the ligand electrons here and the metal electrons here. Actually, I don't uh, agree with that way of thinking about it because that's the ionic model and this is covalent. But the way your instructor is thinking about it is, your instructor is thinking that first the transition metal gives up electrons to the ligands and then the ligands uses the electrons to form these. The key thing is that these are the lone pairs on the metal. These will be the lone pairs and these will be the shared electrons. Or these are the bonds that we're forming with the ligands and these are the metals. So, um, so you can see, as he mentioned here, you could fit a maximum of six lone pairs in here. So when we're filling this first, you fill the ligand part, and then whatever's left over, you put in the transition part. That's right. Is he actually, um, is he actually making you put the electrons in here? That it's more, that's more common in the crystal field theory. Uh, in the crystal field theory, you always have to place the electrons. Uh, I'd be a little surprised if you had to place the electrons here. But yeah, well, we know that e these have to have two electrons each. In order for these to be bonds, they have to have two electrons each. So yeah, if you put the electrons in here first, then the electrons that are left over would go here. So it's certainly possible that some of these could be empty. That's right. OK, so that's the octahedral model. Again, let me just point out, this is just completely different from the crystal field theory. Remember, in the crystal field theory, we weren't hybridizing the d orbitals. We just had five unhybridized d orbitals. and in that theory, we thought of all of those unhybridized d orbitals as getting the lone pairs. These are just two different models that are useful in different situations. Okay, so um, can I erase this? Let's say that you are going to form uh, the square planar. Um, so how many hybrid orbitals are we going to need for square planar? Six, no, four. Four, four corners of the square. So we're going to form four of these. Uh, and it turns out that we only use two of the p orbitals and the s orbital. So how many d orbitals will we need? Three. Just one to get four overall, right? We want, we want to be blending together four orbitals overall. So if we use two of the p's and one of the s's, then we'll need one of the d's. So then that would give us three unhybridized d orbitals left over. And how many hybrid orbitals do we get? Four. four. Conservation. If we're blending four orbitals, we get four blended orbitals out. And what would be a good label for these orbitals? DSP2. Of course, if you're only using one of something, we usually leave the superscript out. So there's one d, one s, and two p's. Four orbitals to get a four-cornered figure. Yeah, and you just get, you just memorize that it turns out that if you put so if we were really good at math, we could take the uh, mathematical descriptions of these and see that when you take a weighted average, that gives you a square figure. But we, we can't figure that out in the introductory course. We're just going to memorize that this is what you blend together to get a square figure. Notice that um, how many unhybridized p orbitals do we have left over? One. There's also a bottle of pear juice that we haven't put in the blender, so we'll also have this left over. 
And then your instructor said that the 3D is where they said they were going to put the metal electrons, which I would call the lone pairs on the metal. Um, they call these the ligand electrons. They're going to use the hybrid orbitals for the ligand electrons. I would prefer just to say they're going to use the hybrid orbitals for the covalent bonds. They're going to use the hybrid orbitals for the covalent bonds with the ligands. And this will be empty, according to your instructor. That kind of makes sense because uh, we know that uh, the P block is higher in energy than the D block. So we're probably not going to have enough lone pairs to, to get all the way up to here. So this will be empty. So we can fit a maximum of eight electrons, eight lone pairs in here. And that's uh, square planar. OK, so that's the model for square planar. We might as well finish up with the tetrahedral. Which should be easy, um, because we learned how to do that last semester. Now, how many corners are there in a tetrahedron? Three. Still four. Uh, and what do we um, mix together for the tetrahedron? SP3. SP3. You already learned last term that the tetrahedron is SP3. And how many hybrid orbitals will that give you? Four. four. So how many unhybridized d orbitals will we, will we have left over? All of them. All of them. How many is that? Five. Five. So this is what the picture would look like for tetrahedral. You already learned about this last term. The only thing that's new is that last term you usually worked with second and third. Uh, you usually worked with second period elements which don't even have a d block. In the last term, you worked with things that were so high there was no d block. Um, so it was just sp3, and there were no leftover orbitals. Um, but if there is a d block, we can put them here. Um, so that would be the uh, d block. And again, here the metal can put its lone pairs, and here it can make covalent bonds to the ligands. So nothing is ever doing this work? Uh, well, it's not, some of these d orbitals might be empty. We don't, these don't have to be all filled with lone pairs. Um, but nothing here. Um, has to be empty. I suppose theoretically you could fill all these up. Well, that, that would be an awful lot of lone pairs. Okay, so we kind of already saw the tetrahedral last time. So your instructor here said, notice, maximum of six electrons, maximum of eight, and maximum of ten, which means some of these could be empty, but it holds a maximum of ten. By the way, do you guys remember the idea that if you're in the third period or below, you can break the octet rule? and have more than eight electrons? Well, this is why. Because if you're in the third period, you can have eight electrons in your sp3 orbitals, and then you can put extra lone pairs in your d orbitals. Um, so the reason why you can have expanded octets for the third period and below is because the third period is the first one that has d orbitals. Of course, that wouldn't work for oxygen or fluorine that are in the second period, because they don't have a d block, and they have to obey the octet rule. OK, so just like. Um, Phosphorus and sulfur from the, from the 3P block can have an expanded octet. All the transition metals can have expanded octets, in a sense, because they all have a D block. So they could have eight electrons in their bonds plus extra lone pairs with, um, without uh, breaking uh, any rules. OK, so this would be um, our uh, tetrahedral shape. All right, um, so that's the valence bond uh, model for uh, how the, the bonds are formed uh, inside the coordination complex. These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos.htm. Or you can just use the link in the info box. Thank you.